This is a quick overview of crystal field theory, including some discussion on what makes uh, high spin and low spin um, configurations. So to start off, I've drawn five spaces for orbitals. These are the D orbitals. They have five spaces. And when we put them in a ligand field like this, we have a metal and we have an octahedral field. These ligands are going to interact with the dz squared orbital and the dx squared minus y squared orbital a lot more strongly than they will the orbitals that are in between the ligands. And so those two orbitals get pushed up higher. And the reason why they get pushed up higher is there's sigma donation or direct bond donation, direct overlap between the ligand and the metal that's going to push up two of those orbitals. Again, the dz squared and the x squared minus y squared. So two of these orbitals are going to get pushed up a little higher in energy. And this is because of sigma donation. And then two of these or, or three of these orbitals can be stabilized by pi interactions with the ligands because the pi interactions will be in those spaces where the other orbitals are. And if the metal can send some of its electron density back into the ligand through back bonding, that can stabilize those orbitals, lowering them in energy. So we'll have some lower orbitals. And I'm just going to write a pi here so that we remember that this is a pi stabilization. Now, because of group theory and the way that we have things labeled, these are called the T2G orbitals in the octahedral geometry. And these are called the EG. E stands for doubly degenerate. G stands for Garrett. It's symmetric about inversion. Uh, and then the T is triply degenerate and it's uh, not symmetric about a rotation or a reflection. So it's a two, but it is symmetric about inversion. So that's those orbitals there. I believe it's a rotation in this case. Um, so the important thing to realize here though, is that if we have a strong sigma donation and we have some pi acceptance going on, this gap can be made even bigger, right? And the size of that gap, we call it the delta octahedral. Because we're in an octahedral field and that's the difference between these two. So let's write, um, destabilized by sigma donation. And that's from the ligand, right? Sigma electrons directly overlapping with the orbitals that these two orbitals pushes them up. And then we have stabilized by pi, and this is acceptance. This is where the ligand allows electrons from the metal to go to it, and that will delocalize these electrons here, because these are the ones that would be donated back to the ligand, and anytime we can delocalize electrons, they get stabilized, and thus would lower their energy. Now, 
Why is this important? Well, it's important to understand the bonding characteristics inside of a, uh, an inorganic complex, but it also has uh, implications when we talk about the number of electrons that a complex has. So very briefly, I will uh, touch on this. So I'm drawing two cases. This case, we have a much lower delta octahedral. That is, the ligands aren't as strong. They don't have a very good pi donation or sigma donation, and they don't have very good pi acceptance. And over here, they do have very good sigma donation, and they have very good pi acceptance. That's why the energy gap is much larger. Now, when we fill these orbitals, we'll start off fill one electron in, and there's no difference between these two. And also with two electrons or three d electrons. But now we get a choice. We can either put the electron next to another electron, or we can put the electron in a higher energy orbital. And the question is, which is the lower energy? Now, it takes energy to put an electron next to another electron. That's called the electron pairing energy. It takes energy to pair up electrons. So, if the energy to pair up an electron is more than the energy that it takes to put the electron in the higher orbital, the electron will go in the higher orbital. And in this case, let's say that the higher orbital is less energy than the energy that it would take to put another electron there. So that one goes there. Now, in this case, it's a much bigger energy gap. So the electron pairing energy was less. So the electron goes down here. Now, there's two names for these kinds of configurations. And at this point, we can explain what those names are. In this case, it's called high spin, and this one's called low spin. This one's called high spin because it has more unpaired electrons, thus more electron spin. Then in this case, this one has only two unpaired electrons because two of them are paired now. So this is low spin. So this is high spin. This is low spin. Now you'll also hear these called low field, in other words, low splitting, and high field, or higher splitting. And uh, try not to get the too confused about that, but uh, so low field. And this is high field. Now we can continue to fill in the electrons and I can do that very quickly. But the point here is these two configurations are different and the main reason for that is the splitting of the d orbitals. So d5 and so five unpaired electrons there, only one there. d6, now we have a full shell down there. Now we'll have to pair up some there. So this should be readily apparent using a magnetic susceptibility experiment, experiment to determine the difference between these two. That's an experiment that you can use to measure how many unpaired electrons there are in a um, complex. There'd be zero here, there'd be four there. Very easy to tell these apart. Uh, now when we get to D7, We'll put an electron up there. Now, this electron being high up in energy has some effects that we'll end up talking about later. And then when we get to uh, D8, you'll notice that the configurations go back to being the same. Um, we have a full T2G orbital in both cases, and we have a half-filled EG orbital. And then a D9, same thing. Same with D10. So 
those are the differences uh, between high spin and low spin and where they come from can be explained by crystal field theory.